Hey, it's me, John Cryer, and I just enjoyed talking to Kara so much uh, that I hope you will listen to this whole podcast because because uh, uh, it was a blast. Hi, friends. It's Kara. Welcome back to Really Famous. John Cryer and I are about to get very personal. Yes, he's got all kinds of Brat Pack stories. He dated somebody super famous, and he has some stories about who he calls ice cubes. And of course, he talks about his new show, Extended Family. And we talk about Charlie Sheen because, yes, you know, two and a half men. So let's go. I'm in the middle of reading your book. Oh, oh, thank you for, for checking it out. I'm much appreciated. Yeah, I started two days ago, but okay. I'll tell you what, I'm already halfway through. And I'm like, oh, this is a good book. I love memoirs, first of all, and yours is good. And you have such a good voice. And it's so, like, you can, you can your personality, your sense of humor definitely comes through on the page. Oh, thank you. I, I was terrified to write that book for a couple of reasons. Well, I, I, I was first approached by the, the, um, by the publishers uh, just as the final season of Two and a Half Men was happening. And I sensed that they, they uh, I, I said, I don't, I, I'd love to write a book for you guys, but I, A, don't know how to write a book, and B, I don't know exactly what the story would be. You know, it's just a, just a memoir of my life. It's like, okay, well, what's the story of that, you know? And, um, uh, and I realized sort of in, in talking with them that they wanted, that the sort of behind the scenes of what happened when uh, uh, Two and a Half Men kind of fell apart um, was, was a big um, was a big driver for them. And I thought, well, okay, that is interesting. Yeah. That was that being in the eye of that crazy international shitstorm was was remarkable. Uh, and uh, but then I went back over my life and I was like, my my career in show business has been bizarre for decades. Yes. <laughs> and I thought, oh, okay, there's the book. That's what the book is. The book is how weird your life can be in show business. Uh, and uh, so so that actually made it a lot easier to write. Um, and the first the first uh, the first part I wrote was there's a long story about a, a play that I did in London where it, that went spectacularly wrong one night and I don't know if you're at that yet mm -hmm. um, but uh, uh, that was the first thing I wrote and I was like once I wrote that I had the voice of the thing got it uh, uh, and then I wrote the, the beginning which was the Bob Altman movie I did uh, and it but again it all just rolled out of that uh, once once uh, I understood how weird my career was. Yeah. <laughs> it got a lot easier. I mean, it's it's great. You just went right in, so you get easily into the book, and your stories are so vivid. And I was like, these are stories that I know everybody wants to talk about Charlie Sheen. I get it. And, it, you know, I saw that you were on The View recently, and, of yes. course, all the news outlets pulled all of the things that you said about if you would ever work with him again. Yes, and and by the way, I'm doing a, a big uh, Television Critics Association conference today, and I'll bet you <laughs> that the vast majority of questions will be about that. And it's partially because uh, Charlie Sheen is a fascinating personality. He's somebody we've we've grown up with. He was, you know, uh, 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 he's a wildly talented guy. You know, he's uh, unfortunately also a very complicated guy. Uh, <laughs> and so I get it. I get why people are, are fascinated fascinated by it. Um, uh, but, you know, uh, uh, there's there's a lot of other stuff that went down as well. Yeah, there is a lot of other stuff. And so I'm reading it. I'm like, oh, this is good stuff. So I'm writing it down. I'm like, oh, must ask him about this. So as we're starting and we're, we're talking, or we're talking, you're talking about um, Pretty in Pink. And um, so the, you had this one sentence about working with Molly Ringwald and Andrew McCarthy. Mm -hmm. And the sentence was, because you were trying to buddy up to them. Yes. Because you're friendly. And obviously, from the minute that I walked into this room or you walked in and we, whatever, very friendly, bubbly with everybody. Like, it seems like you're, everybody would like you. Why wouldn't they? You have that personality. Uh, well, I, 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 I like people. I really do. And I'm, I'm fascinated by them. And I like to get to know people. And um, it really helps as an actor because yeah. you, once you start being interested in everybody's story, story there's stories everywhere you know um so it it really it really helps um but yeah when i it was a uh, when i started working on pretty and pink it was a bit of a a, a, a jarring adjustment for me because mm -hmm. i had come from doing theater um where there's a spirit of bonhomie and these and and everybody you know uh, the, the the found family of a cast 
is is very powerful yeah. and it's really fun and you're all working toward this thing that has to where you all have to be on the exact same page to make it all work perfectly but a film is not that at all mm -hmm. a film is just little bits they just have to make every little bit perfect and that's a very different uh, uh thing to be demanded of you and so so actors on movies often don't you know you can be in a in a movie with another actor and never meet them <laughs> yeah, that's so weird. Um, cuz it's done in such small bits. So I was not used to that. And I was I was hoping that these other young actors were who were in the same place as me probably also super excited to be a part of this new big project mm -hmm. and you know and and you know like wow guys we're doing this amazing thing. Um I and, and and when I got there, I was like, no, that is not how they felt. <laughs> and they they were both very guarded and remote, and um, and you know, uh, both of them had actually already worked more than I had at that point. Um, so I was a little intimidated by them. Um, but I actually, interestingly, uh, recently had a chance to talk with Andrew McCarthy at length Why? because he's shooting a, a new documentary called uh, Bratz, which will be out pretty soon. So and are you on that? I am on that, okay, actually. Cool. He, he asked if he would interview nice. me. At, and it's weird when you have what people imagine is, you know, 30 plus years of enmity like we, we've been yeah. you know people have said they didn't like each other for a long time so i didn't even know that by the way and like yeah. this is i grew up on john hughes movies and whatnot mm -hmm. but i don't remember ever knowing that it was it came as a surprise to me it was sort of apparently by design of the director how, howie deutsch um kind of wanted us to not get along mm -hmm. great um he uh, even though we had weeks of rehearsal where the three of us were hanging out and all, all that stuff. Uh, uh, he kind of tried to, to poke the bear a little bit and, and make sure our relationship was always a little discordant. Uh -huh. uh, but, uh, uh, but yeah, so... But tell so, me about the conversation, because I did oh, hear... Yeah, well, that's important. Well, yeah, so I get, a, I get a text from Andrew McCarthy, and I'm like, why am I getting texts from Andrew McCarthy at all? Uh, <laughs> and he was saying, hey, man, I'm going to be in town. Uh, I, I'm trying to shoot a documentary about, you know, what, what we all went through in the 80s. Would you be open to, to talking about it? And I was just like, first of all, just taken aback that he, you know, that he... Um, uh, wanted me to take part in this. Um, but also, uh, but I, I had actually run into him backstage at The View mm -hmm. once. They were they were shooting an episode that he was on and I was shooting another episode after him. And we just ran into each other in the green room and he was so friendly and nice. And I was like, oh, why did I get the impression we couldn't get along? Yeah. You know, is it just that we're grownups now and we're, we're, you know, not stupid teenagers anymore? Is that perhaps why? Um, but it's interesting because in his his memoir, and he went into this uh, uh, when we when we talked for the documentary, um, he was already battling alcoholism uh, when he was you know w when we shot Pretty in Pink, which is you know I think he was twenty years old and I was I was twenty, mm. and I so I had read his sort of remoteness as that he didn't like me, but. Uh, but in reality, he was just trying to hold it all together and be a professional on a set when he was already dealing with, uh, you know, needing to drink all the time, you know. Uh, um, and so uh, it, it was really a revelation to me because it, 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 you know, once again hammered home that that you can't know what other people are, are going through and, and that you project so much onto what other people uh, are, are feeling because, you know, we're we're human beings and, and we interpret things hundred percent and you took that you said you took that information with you in the future right yes. to do, understand I'm gonna try people. and understand and just say you know what you never know what other people are going through and you don't know where they're at and try to just look at people with empathy and understanding because you just never know when that yeah. guy cuts you off and on the freeway it's like maybe he's he's got to get to that doctor's appointment or you know he, he's you know or he, who knows yeah There's, <laughs> um, that's one of my favorite examples to use too when people get like road rage about mm -hmm. other people cutting them off and whatnot is like you have no idea what's going on in that person's life it's not a personal offense against you yeah it's them and that's the same with most interactions is whatever happens between two people a lot of times it has to do with them rather than you yes and, and that and that's a huge thing to learn now that i'm you know in my 50s <laughs> it's just like few uh, well i learned I, i'm finally learning things yeah but that's a good one that's a good one i'm yes, telling you i'm, a, I'm a therapist by the way as well oh. so just fyi okay settle in kara uh, <laughs> this one's gonna be me? a good one you're this is gonna be a gold mine for you uh, <laughs> i already know all your innermost oh, thoughts from great. your book oh well thank you and now I, I'm, they're just seeping out of your brain that'll just that that i think that just makes it a whole 
it makes it much more convenient for you. Just that it's all in book form. <laughs> uh, you don't have to worm it out of me. Uh, no, we'll have fun. Yeah, but it's mm-hmm. true though. That is a, a, to understand what people's issues are mm-hmm. really gives you an advantage on how to manage your own emotions and like not yeah. get caught up in things that you think are about you that just aren't. Yeah, yeah, and that's you know that's a, a great lesson to learn professionally and personally, and you know, and and also in a business like uh, uh, entertainment where you're dealing with a bunch of artists, all of whom want to contribute. I mean, yeah. I, when I, when I was directing, I directed a few episodes of two and a half men and went and directed mom for Chuck and another show for him. And, uh, and when you start to realize everybody, you know, most of these people really want to help. They want to give you something as an artist. You can get amazing stuff out of people because they want mm. to give you amazing stuff. They want to be a part of this. They want to contribute something. And I was like, oh my God, it is not my job to to make my mark and make this thing look like John Cryer has a style. It's my job to bring the best out of everybody who's yes. there. <laughs> you know, uh, and that was another revelation and really really helpful to me because uh, I had because I had wanted to be a director as a kid. That's actually how I started um, wanting to be in the arts and uh, I wanted to direct movies and uh, and. You know, I got into acting kind of just because it was the the thing that sort of brought me out of, out of my shell. You know, uh, uh, just interpersonally, I was kind of shy as a kid. So, uh, uh, you know, sort of again, that was something that I I didn't start actually directing people until I was uh, until I was in my late forties. You know, mm-hmm. so I uh, uh, so again, that was a, 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 a another great thing to discover as I got older. Yeah, for sure. And I would imagine that would be kind of a relief that, oh, it's about bringing out the best in everybody else, not yes. about like It takes the pressure myself. off of you. And, yeah. you know, and, and, uh, and a lot of great directors, you, you know, uh, they're, they're, they're like, you know, there's the David Finchers who's like, who, who knows every technical aspect and sweats every detail in every shot. And then there's people who, who just go, you know what, let me get the best possible people for this and let me trust them mm-hmm. um, that they'll, that they'll do something wonderful with right. this. Right. Okay, I have to just go back to the one line because I think it's okay. a great line. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't want to go past it and then we'll go and back I and then we'll pass it. Blue past it. No, no, it's and all good. gave you a whole bunch of other crap and I apologize. I no, please. <laughs> I love the whole bunch of other crap. That's okay. what it's all about. That's as a, I that told you be, before. That should be the name of the show. <laughs> a bunch of other crap. Rename. <laughs> <laughs> Relaunch. Um mm-hmm. okay, so you said something like about trying to buddy up to those two ice cubes. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It was so uh, and, funny. Well, because it was because, yeah, because Molly, uh, 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 Molly Ringwald is a wonderful actress, partially because of what she holds back, um, uh, because she doesn't just put it all out there. She lets the, the viewer sort of discover who she is. Um, and that's wonder That was wonderful as a teenager, because, you again, the viewer could project mm-hmm. stuff onto her. Yes. <laughs> um, and uh, like there's like Clint Eastwood is an actor like that as well. You know, he's kind of stoic. Um, and the, you know, very little parts, he, he lets, he lets the viewer really know very small parts of him, you know, um, uh, a lot of wonderful actors are like that. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, and s- same thing with Andrew. Andrew is very subtle, Andrew McCarthy. And, and, uh, uh, you know, he, uh, again, that, that was part of what was great about him as a, as a young performer. So, uh, but it is, it was tough for me because I just have this interpersonal thing that I want to yeah. really engage, sure. you know, and I want to feel like I know people and I want that, that is my sense of safety. Um, but in, in terms of Pretty in Pink, it really worked because that made my character try even harder mm-hmm, and, you know, mm-hmm. end up doing this big dance in the record store and all that stuff. Um, and, uh, and that, that was really true and good for that particular dynamic. Yeah. By the way, I have that same thing. I really want to connect with everybody I meet. Mm-hmm. I want to have that genuine connection. Like, and when I don't have it, I don't like it. Yes. It, it, well, it feels, well, because yeah, this, what's the point of this? If not to, to, to connect with people. Yeah. 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 So I get it. I can totally relate to that. Well, and you know, I don't think it's the worst affliction to have. It is not. It is not. It uh, suits you and as both a therapist and uh, as a podcast host. 
uh, uh, any other professions you choose to? <laughs> well, well, now that you mention let's it. Let's sit back, sweetie. Let's talk about stuff. Would what you, are you, where do you want to go? <laughs> would you believe I started as an accountant? No, I would not believe that because, <laughs> no, I know. because it's, an, it's not no. the, the skills that seem to excite you are not involved in that much. I mean, nothing against accountants. God bless them. They're amazing. Uh, and I'm grateful for mine, you know. Yeah. Uh, but... Um, uh, but but yeah, it wouldn't seem like the no, thing that would engage. No, you. it accidentally happened. I got a degree in accounting, undergrad, and I ended up doing a little bit of you know numbers work for a year. Didn't last long. Couldn't stand it. What was what uh, attracted you about it to begin with? Why did um, you when nothing. when you saw the list of courses, you say, hmm, ooh, accounting? You know, Here's it must have it happened did. somewhere. It happened. It happened because. My intention was gonna go was to go into television and film in some way, and I don't know even know what I, broadcasting production. I'm not even sure what I had my sights set on. I just knew I loved entertainment, and to get a degree in whatever it was, I was at the University of Florida. I had to have certain classes to graduate on time, and some that mass communications class mm -hmm. was like full, and I couldn't get it, so I would be delayed in graduating. So I'm looking at all my friends who have business majors, and they're getting any class they want, and I'm like, oh, I guess I could see myself as like in a power suit and doing business mm -hmm. and stuff. And accounting seems like a real profession. It's real I'm solid. I'm gonna do it. Yeah. Well, also. Uh, genuinely useful in the rest of your life, I would imagine. I mean, I, I no, you don't think so? Yeah, okay, mm. I run my own business, so yes. Exactly. And you know I told you I'm obsessed with real estate, so now it's coming back in a little bit, but no. I'm really bad with numbers. Oh, oops. <laughs> well, that, that, that would cut down on your, your accounting yes. prowess. Yes, uh, <laughs> I, So I think it did help me in some way, but thank God I didn't do it. So okay. yeah, anyway, long winding road, I found myself here, and this mm. is the place that I, that I need to be, and I love it. Oh, good. Um, okay, let's get back to you for a second. I do appreciate the question back of me. I think that's a really good, I like a guest who can do that. <laughs> and it shows that you're listening, engaged, and interested. Well, well, thank you. My, my wife is actually a wonderful, she's uh, Lisa Joyner. She was uh, uh, an entertainment reporter, so she is a wonderful interviewer. Uh -huh. And she has taught me over the years about, you know, that there is a... Uh, uh, um, because as I've said, I, 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 I'm always curious about people, but I never knew quite how the skills to help them open up. And she was like, well, honey, <laughs> here's what you do. That's very um, useful. Uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, that has been very helpful. What's the big trick? Did she? Oh, you well, one? just if, if, if a subject comes up, ask them about it. Interrogate them. To why did this thing mean to them? Why? Ask why. Don't ask what happened. Ask why. And you're an interviewer now, so you, I'm uh -huh. sure, are way ahead of me on this. But... Um, uh, uh, but the whys are really where the interesting things happen and people open up about their stories when, it, when, yep. when, uh, when you ask them why. Yeah, and you have to be able to see the interesting things too, yeah. right? So you have to be able to fully engage and be listening in a curious way. Yes. And then you see, oh, that is interesting. As a therapist, one of the th first things that we learned was only open-ended questions. So you don't yeah. ask a yes or a no. Yeah. So, I mean, obvi that's obvious. Yes, that's describe the... what that was like. That that helps oh. a lot. Uh, By the way, folks, uh, we, are, we are in a beautiful place where we are recording this. However, for some reason, <laughs> next door, they are, uh, it sounds as though they are, are building a restaurant. Uh, <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's a lot of, uh, a lot of silverware is getting clanged and, and washed and there's uh, orders being barked. It's like the bear. There's an episode of the bear being shot <laughs> about four <laughs> feet from us. So, uh, uh, so if you hear a clanging or something like that, uh, please forgive it uh, because we, well, this, this place was incredibly quiet when we started yes, recording. Yes, yes, yes. But it's it's all about realism, right? This yes. podcast is all about realism. Yes. So authenticity, okay. this is where we are. And I like that you explained it because now everybody gets it. They feel even more like they're hanging out with us yes, exactly. at the Langham Hotel in Pasadena, in, California. In lovely Pasadena. And this is your this is part of your press tour, I guess you would call it, or your yes. press day for Extended Family, your new show. Yes. So I don't want to I don't want to do the same questions. Okay. So Come I'm going to avoid ones. them. So well, let's just say this. So um why did you do that? <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. That's a fair question. Um, I have, uh, 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 I did this show 
uh, extended family because mostly because uh, I miss being in front of an audience. Um, we had gone through COVID and a lot of the shows that were audience shows that were multi-camera shows stopped shooting with audiences. Mm -hmm. uh, it's ended up being a really long, crazy process because we started up the show almost two years ago. Um, and uh, uh, and then the the they, the administration at NBC changed, mm -hmm. and then uh, the strike happened, and then you know right and, and I was sure we were done after that, I, and and then uh, uh, no, we get a call right before the 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 strike is over saying, hey, if we're if 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 you're up for it, we want to put you on right after. Uh, you know, we want your yeah. show to be the first show back, and when I was stunned and happy, but. That meant, oh crap, zero to sixty. We've uh -huh. got to start this show back up again. Um, and it's it's been such a joy. It has been such a joy to to be a part of a show. You know, I, I've done shows. I was I was in the room for the last few years of of Two and a Half Men in the writers' room, and and it was really. Um, and creating a, a show from scratch is a very different uh, uh, prospect. Uh -huh. And uh, so you were mm -hmm. in the writers' room on Two and a Half Men. Well, yeah. Not, I mean, I was there. I was in and out. Oh, they, just kind of like participating. Yeah, they, no, well, it was interesting because uh, uh, Jim Patterson, who ran the show for the last four years, last four seasons of the show, actually probably the last five or six seasons, um, he uh, w once we were uh, we shut down because of uh, uh, Charlie Sheen's uh, implosion. Um, when we tried to redo the show with Ashton, it was a whole new thing because we were reinventing mm. the show. So he asked me to start coming in if, as much as I could oh, that's to cool. sort of help. Uh, I was, became sort of the institutional memory of the show to some degree. Um, and also uh, they found that Chuck was much, uh, uh, he, he enjoyed, Chuck Lorre, the, the guy who ran the show, um, was more, uh, uh, he had more fun when I helped them pitch the new episodes uh, oh, okay. <laughs> um, just like because that. I was around yeah, yeah. and I could sort of inform how the the my how how Alan was going to be in that situation was going to work um, so so I ended up it, that was a, an invaluable experience because uh, uh, that was an incredibly joyful uh, writer's room and uh, just a remarkable level of skill um, to keep a show fresh after you know at that point we'd shot eight seasons and we were you know we ended up shooting four more um, it and, was like 200 something episodes when yeah. it's all said and done yeah so that was uh, uh, so that 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 life can be just so lovely and fun and you know when uh, you know when, when actors can keep from having world world destroying meltdowns uh, right. <laughs> that life can be incredibly fun so um, I mean how did you keep how did you keep it together when all of that was going on it was very tumultuous so like you're just kind of you have no control really. yes that that is the first thing just accepting that you have no control that's a good thing in life yes. uh, because control is an illusion you know we 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 like to think that we do and and uh, especially in show business, because you're literally making these sort of fake worlds, uh -huh. um, you feel like you have control over them, and you're you're trying to make art that, you know, again, uh, 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 you feel you have, you know, you're being judged by, so you should have some control over it, you know. But again, y you discover the limits of all that when you're when you're working um, that you don't have the control. You you think, oh wow, things are going great. The show's a huge hit. What could possibly go wrong? Oh wait, my co-star <laughs> could suddenly uh, uh, lose it and uh, and just flame out and get fired. And so suddenly we've got to figure something else out. And you've just got to roll with the situation you're dealt. You know, at that point. Oh, oh man. No. Oh man. So to, so, a napkin? Yes. Do we have a napkin? If we have a, if we have like a, a wet wipe, that would be ideal. I have a makeup remover wipe. That would be perfect. I'm gonna I, get that. Just so you know, folks, uh, I've spilled my coffee all over myself at this moment when gesturing uh, sure very I strongly. Have makeup. <laughs> I have makeup remover. But we have makeup remover. Cara has makeup remover. By the way, do you prefer Cara or Cara? Cara. Cara, but okay. I really want to know from New York, so I say Cara. Yes, okay, gotcha. Yes, no, it was an issue on, on Supergirl because 
Uh, oh, yes, right. I think so. Okay. Because yeah, that was Kara and Kara. That's right. And uh, and oh, the the and the you know the people the the fans are have very strong feelings. So what uh, did they say about that? And, what did uh, the fans say? No, no, no. Say? It, well, because yeah, it's Kara. Do you want um, another one? On that, that one. I no, I think we're good actually. Okay. I think this is this is amazing. Yes, okay. I'm going to be coffee flavored for the rest of the day, and that's fine. That's as it should be. And I'm still going to finish my coffee. Okay, perfect. Good, good. <laughs> if um, I gesture, uh, I'm going to pay the price. We'll see. Yeah, so I say Kara. Okay. Um, I went to school in Florida, so I t- turned a little bit into Kara okay. at the time. So I'm like mm. a little in between now, but I remember talking to Louis Anderson on my show, and mm. he, he told me, I think it was the second time he was on, he said, you know, you need to tell everybody at the beginning of your show, uh-huh. my name is Kara, or Kara, <laughs> um, like I care about you because everyone's always stressed out. <laughs> Out because they might want to call you by your name and they don't know what to say. Yes. And I did not take that advice, but it's Kara. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, Thank you. Very helpful. So, okay, so everything's out of control. You're And also, side note, therapist side note, mm-hmm. when you try, when you want to be a controlled person, you want to control things, it actually makes you less in control. It makes you miserable. So yeah. understanding that it's okay to not control everything is actually much healthier. Yes, and also the thing about it, the entertainment industry and the thing that drives people insane in the entertainment industry is you are held responsible for things you don't actually mm, have control over. Okay. And uh, that's why executives are nuts, especially um, because their their jobs are especially nebulous. Um, and uh, uh, But it, it drives actors, writers, mm. everybody a little crazy. Um, uh, uh, and again, that was a, an important thing I realized because I was like, oh, okay, you know, I just have to accept that some things will work and some things won't. Right. Uh, uh, and I, I just have to keep pouring positivity into things and some things will come together and some things will fall apart. So did, was um, that automatic for you or did you have to work on that? Uh, I had to work on that and uh-huh. I, it, it took it took you know there there uh, uh, like I, it was very hard for me I did a show called the famous Teddy Z many years ago for CBS and that was a very hard experience for me because it was my first experience in multi-camera television after doing movies um, and uh, and it was a show that hung on me it was you know I was the star of the show and the critics loved it the critics loved it so out of the gate it was expected to be this huge hit it was on CBS after Murphy Brown oh. so that was a yeah that yeah. was a primo spot um, and everybody was incredibly excited about it and it failed within half a season and I took that so personally I just really felt like uh, uh, you know this was this all hung on me and I blew it uh, and um uh, and I went into like a minor depression over it, and and uh, you know it really it really rocked me, and uh, uh, I I didn't want to do another multicam for for a couple of years, um, and then I did a show called Partners for the Fox Network, um, which was a total reversal of that experience. Mm. It was directed by Jim Burroughs. It was written oh, by Jim Burroughs. Been on my show a couple times. Yes, Three, wonderful. I think, yeah, really wonderful, yeah. fun. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, irascible, uh, uh-huh. <laughs> but um, but an amazing director, and you uh-huh. see why he is the 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 legend in this as the directors of multi camera sitcoms is. I mean, he directed Taxi and Cheers yeah. and Friends and you know and Will and Grace and you know he is the guy. He's the guy. Um, uh, but he uh, uh, but working with him and working with the writers Jeff Greenstein and Jeff Strauss and the rest of the writers room, uh, it was such a a, a, a joyful experience that I was like, oh, okay, this can be, uh-huh. uh, this can be wonderful, uh, and this doesn't have to be a painful experience. That show died as well, <laughs> <laughs> mind you, but it was a much more positive oh, okay. experience, um, and I started to really like the form that I had loved to watch as a kid. I mean, I loved multi Oh, as I know. A kid. You mentioned Facts of Life. Hello. Yes. We all grew up on Come Facts on. of Life. Facts of Life. Please, one of the best. Sanford and Son mm. and the Jeffersons and All the in the Family yes. and Mary Tyler Moore Show and all those things. So, so mm. I just have to point one thing out, though, because when you, because there's a whole other story. And you did, I'll just give a little nod to Mark Marin for his uh, interview with you because okay. he talked a lot about <laughs> a this. A grudging nod. So yeah, whatever. <laughs> all right, he's yeah, the competitor, he but... Yeah, he right. out of you, whatever. Uh. <laughs> now, everybody, everybody who listens to my show knows I like Mark Marin's show. Okay. He's a good interviewer. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll throw people to that podcast next. Um, okay. <laughs> because he went over a lot of... You guys talked a lot about your 
Broadway experiences and um, but I'm getting this from your book though that when you were fired your mom said that she knew you were going to make it in entertainment because of your attitude do you remember this you said you were mad at them yes I was mad at them and I I, I wanted revenge uh, no, that's not. That is not what she noticed. Uh, no, she. she I, I. I was mad at them, and I wanted to prove to them. Yeah. That I could. That I could do this instead and, of feeling feeling like you were responsible for being. Well, I mean, yes. you did take responsibility. The, so. Yeah, but but it was uh, 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 um, having that sort of fire in the belly. Yeah. And having something you want to prove is helpful in this business because it the the the. the the business is not fair, um, and uh, and it is, you know, that really knocks you down a lot. Um, so having, you know, some fire that that yeah. that, uh, that that keeps you going um, uh, is is really helpful. Um, and I was young; I was, you know, I was eighteen years old when that right. happened, and uh, I was just starting out. And I felt, and it felt like such an unfair situation. Just to fill you in, what what happened was uh, I had. Um, uh, I had gotten a job as Matthew Broderick's understudy in Brighton Beach Memoirs on Broadway, and Matthew was a huge, was becoming a huge star at that point because he was amazing in the show, absolutely amazing. And uh, and this, so this was an incredibly plum job that I had as his understudy. And in fact, he was going to be going away for an extended period, so I was going to probably have to take over. And everybody was very kind of nervous about it. And then he won the Tony mm. uh, uh, for Best Actor. So now that. Uh, at, adds even more pressure to it uh, and I was his understudy and they, they don't as an understudy they don't actually give you very much time to work on it uh, understudies only rehearse twice a week um, and uh, and you don't rehearse with the regular cast you rehearse with the other understudies so I was still very discombobulated and the part was huge so after six weeks we did a run through and, and I still needed some help with some of the lines I was still I still had to call line a couple yeah. of times and after we we did that run through, um, the the next day, I I my manager called me and said, "Hey, don't bother going into rehearsal today." And I was like, "I'm sorry, <laughs> and just don't bother." And he said, "Yeah, yeah, come down. You may want to talk to me." And he let me know that they had fired me, uh-huh. uh, and that was devastating, absolutely devastating to me at the time. Um, uh, and and uh, you know. I, but I wasn't prepared. I wasn't. I, I, I should have worked harder. I should have had the lines by then. You know, six weeks in, you know, even if you only have two rehearsals a week, you should know it by then. Mm, everything um, is a lesson. <laughs> everything was a lesson for you, it feels yeah. like, um, the, in all these things. Yeah. Are you still confused with Matthew Broderick today? No, not really. We Our, our looks have diverged over the years somewhat. I have no hair on the top of my head, which helps. Um, so, no, I, I don't get mistaken for him anymore. Um uh, you know, and and uh, and he's you know he remains quite wonderful. Uh, we we've, we've uh, you know we we have talked a, a few times over the years, and interestingly, the last time I ran into him was I think the Tonys, um, or no, or was it when they gathered us for the John Hughes tribute uh, at the Oscars? I don't remember, but uh, um, but he was curious about doing a multi camera sitcom uh, oh. because. It's a life that people yes. aspire to. It's a like wonderful... you have a dream career. Yeah, it's, it's a, your dream career. It it, it is. I it, know you originally wanted to be a director. Yeah, it is so. It is such a joyful day to day work experience. You know, hanging out with the the uh, you know in the whether you're in the writers room or just on the on the stage. You know, working through the scenes and figuring that out. I mean, it is hard work. Yeah. It is very hard work and uh, and very demanding. But um, but. It's but it that is so overcompensated by the joy mm. that you that you get from it uh, that um, it is it is a, it's sought after by every, I mean Alec uh, 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 Alec Baldwin when I ran into him in New York was all about so wait so what are the hours so how <laughs> you know wait so you're done by what by three o'clock in the afternoon you're, are you kidding me you know <laughs> so uh-huh. that's what he wanted and then he ended up signing on to do one with uh, Kelsey Grammer that ended up not happening oh, wait but, but he um, did Thirty Rock. Yes, but he did Thirty Rock, which was a single camera, was not in front oh, of an audience. Oh, right, right. So that was shot Different like a movie. Mm. Yeah, that was shot like a movie. Right, and there are not that many. It's like Jimmy Burrows and I were talking about yeah. the fact that there are like not many no, of these left, and here you are getting another one. It's, it is. It's considered a dinosaur. It's considered, mm. you know, uh, uh, you know. We still. It's so funny. Like on social media, people still complain. They're like, "Why is there a laugh track? Why can you hear? Why can you hear the audience laughing?" It's like. Because that's how multi-camera sitcoms work. You know, since I love Lucy, you right. can hear the audience. Right. It's like you're doing a play. You know, this is a, this is a, there's nothing wrong with the format. The format is fine. You know, uh, um, 
uh, and so, people are watching it. And people certainly. are watching it, which is lovely. That that uh, it has been it has been sampled quite widely. Has, uh, is is great, um, and uh, we're happy to you know keep the the flame of multicam sitcom alive. Yes. Okay. Speaking of which, um, do me more. Yes. <laughs> the reason I'm saying speaking of which, it seems like a non sequitur, but because <laughs> you had said in your book, like if she was watching when Ashton was on Two and a Half Men and oh, there gosh. we were together, I wonder what she was thinking. Yes. And why <laughs> is that? Because I didn't know this before I read your book and mm. I don't know that everybody else does too. So okay, what is so your relationship? There's a little backstory necessary on this. I, uh, my second movie was a movie called No Small Affair. Uh, which I was cast in, again, uh, taking over for Matthew Broderick. It was originally cast with Matthew Broderick and Sally Field. Um, they fell out of it, so then they cast me and Demi Moore, which is, she, uh, she's not really interchangeable with Wait, Sally Field, but whatever. Wait, it was Sally Field? Wait, it I was, thought it was, uh, oh, God, I'm forgetting her name. Ellen Barkin? Uh, no, Ellen That's Barkin. Different. No, Ellen Barkin auditioned with me. Okay, okay. Um, but, uh, uh, but no, they cast uh, Demi in it. Um, but the the uh, but at any rate, uh, uh, Demi and I uh, did the movie together, and we were both you know really young people, get, you know, getting our first big movie break, and it was so exciting. And we did date for a little while there. Um, it, you know, it was, I thought it was much more serious than she did at the time, uh, and. Um, uh, and she broke it off, and you know, and I. So I was all of nineteen years old, and I was just like, "Oh, I'll never love again," you know, <laughs> um, because that's what you do when you're nineteen. Um, and she and I uh, had been on on you know on on perfectly fine terms, uh, um, and then uh, years later, uh, uh, when. Charlie Sheen fell out of Two and a Half Men, and they're casting Ashton Kutcher. She is his wife at this time, uh, and I and I don't know if he knows that she and I used to date. Uh, <laughs> so at our first meeting, the whole time I'm just sitting there going, "Should I ask him? Should I say, hey, how's the me we used to date?" I don't know how <laughs> I don't know how to handle this thing. And he's lovely, and he's sort of keeping to himself. And you know how when people are remote, that drives me crazy. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And uh, 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 but. At the very end of it, uh, uh, we're both waiting for our cars, and uh, and as his car comes up, he says, "Oh yeah, Demi told me you guys used to date. It's all fine." Nice. And I was like, "Oh, you know that all oh, the whole time <laughs> that was that was hanging over my head." Um, uh, but then it got awkward later because then they split up while we we're shooting. I was like, "Wait a minute, what is happening here? Oh my god!" Wait, you why know? was that awkward though? Well, because it is you know because. Uh, uh, it's like then, you know, he doesn't kind of, it's like, we. so I'm like, been there, bud. You know what? I'm not going to say that. <laughs> right, <laughs> to, right, uh, right, right, right. Uh, you uh, compare to, notes. Although a very funny postscript was in her memoir, she, uh, uh, she, she expressed some level of regret um, for uh, uh, taking my virginity. Uh, in, in a way that she, when she felt like she was not emotionally that into the relationship okay. and that she felt like, you know, it meant a lot to me, but she should have, to have had more reverence for the fact that I was losing my virginity, except that she wasn't my first. Uh, <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, and I, so I, I, on, on social media, I said, while I can certainly understood, understand why she thought uh, uh, it was my first time due to my lack of expertise. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, uh, that was not in fact, in, in fact, my first, and she should feel no remorse about it whatsoever. Uh, <laughs> I hope, uh, I hope she can, she can sleep soundly knowing uh, <laughs> that, that you know, I was just inept because I'm just inept, uh, <laughs> not because it was my first time. It's very interesting, actually, because there are all, are all of these stories that you. Like you know, the Brat Pack or whatever. You've all been in each other's lives at this at this very critical time in your lives, and you're mm -hmm. all with your memoirs, and you're all telling stories, yeah. and you're all remembering things a little bit differently than each other. Yes, it's interesting. It, it's really not like there's nothing like that now, is it? I'm sort of like group of people who. Well, the weird thing is we uh, th uh, that some of us did hang out as friends, but but most of it, I, I didn't hang out with Judd Nelson. I didn't hang out with Andrew Demi. You know, Rob yeah. Lowe. I didn't hang out with that. I didn't hang out with Emilio. 
Estevez. I didn't hang out with Anthony Michael Hall. They just weren't, you know, I didn't, they were work friends when right. I worked with them, you know. <laughs> um, I, I hadn't met Kiefer Sutherland until a couple weeks ago, you know. <laughs> so, but was Kiefer Sutherland part of the Brat Pack? He sort of was. He was, post, he was post Brat Pack because he was like Lost Boys and all that stuff, yeah. you know. So that was just, that was late 80s, maybe early 90s more. But, um, but my point being, uh, uh, you know, we 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 were work right. friends. You know, I I didn't meet Charlie until uh, I mean I met him at an audition. I, I think when I was like 21. But then we didn't work together till we did Hot Shots in in 1990 something. So you know it it doesn't. So you know we we uh, you know we're not um, uh, uh, like I, and I just did Rob Lowe's podcast uh, uh, like a week ago and it's like we had a million things to talk about because uh-huh. we never met. We oh, ne- I mean, we so may have met at stories a, to compa- like, yes. oh. Well, when we had crazy things, because I had just done a podcast about uh, this. It's a wonderful podcast called Lawyers, Guns, and Money. Uh, it is the true story of um, this young uh, public defender in Miami in 1986 uh, who, and, and Miami in 1986 was uh, Scarface, basically. It was just yeah. the Wild West, okay. if you recall. Uh-huh. Uh, it was just drugs and just enormous amounts of, 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 of cash and just corruption. And this young guy gets this, his first client, um, uh, his first felony client is a guy who was uh, arrested with a machine gun and a silencer. And he said, okay, why, why did you have a machine gun and a silencer? And the guy says, oh, well, that's easy. I'm, I'm running guns for the CIA. And the guy said, oh, sh- sure you are. Sure you are. And, uh, and the guy said, no, no, you don't believe me? Here, re- call this phone number. And the guy called the phone number, and it was the White House. Uh, this young public defender, a guy named John Mattis, was the guy who uncovered Iran-Contra, which would end up being one of the biggest presidential scandals in U.S. history. And it was an entire secret war hmm. that was being fought across Central and South America with, uh, you know, that was against the law that the Congress had explicitly um, uh, ruled against. So uh, it's an amazing podcast. It's called Lawyers, Guns, and Money. And um, But the crazy thing was it... it, it um, we're talking about uh, Rob Lowe and I were talking about it, and uh, and uh, we brought up Oliver North, who is a big part of it, and uh, and and is still very active in right wing circles today. And a lot of the people actually involved in it got off with nothing, nothing. <laughs> um, and are still very. Uh, but but, uh, but we started talking about Oliver North, and Fawn Hall came up, who was his uh, his very attractive uh, assistant, who who burned a bunch of documents, who destroyed a bunch of documents, uh, didn't burn them, but destroyed a bunch of documents that were very important to the thing. And she testified before Congress, and Robbo was like, "Oh, I dated her." <laughs> No way. <laughs> I was like, wow. Okay. <laughs> wow. Um, but it was the 80s, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. And there was there was no rules. Everything <laughs> nothing made sense. Um but uh uh but that was like one of the overlaps that I did not foresee. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, no, you wouldn't think that would uh, be the thing. Yeah, but, but again, yeah. It, you know, it, the the when you've had a lot of history and you've been through uh, a lot of this stuff, you do uh, uh, you, you now talking about it as an adult uh, is really kind of fun. Yeah, you know, going it's almost over like it. you went to high school together or something. It is. It is, and this is the reunion. Yeah, um, and yeah. I'm really looking forward to Bratz as a documentary, the the, the one that uh, uh, Andrew directed, because um, because you know he the. That was really formative, the, the whole sort of Brat Pack thing for uh, the people who were in it. It was really, uh, you know, because they started as just these young actors who were just incredibly uh, uh, respected at the time. It was like, wow, there's this whole new generation that are going to be so exciting. And then this article comes out labeling them the Brat Pack, and suddenly the whole thing curdles. The whole thing is just like everybody oh, perceives them. Yeah, no, I don't know if you remember it, but people just perceive them suddenly as entitled young rich uh, performers who don't deserve the success they have and it and and so all the actors suddenly you know suddenly there's less than zero and all these things and everybody looks at them different you know uh uh and it, it was a very weird it was a, an interesting thing to see pop culturally yeah uh, to see oh okay suddenly everybody just decided that that's so crazy. From one article. Right. That's so <laughs> you know? wild. But, I mean, I always look at, like, to me, the Brat Pack is like, these are my peeps. These are, I feel like I grew up with you guys, too. Yeah. And it's just, it feels, it's comforting and whatever. Mm-hmm. And I, that's so crazy how that can just shift just like that. But I think now there's, like, 
a nostalgic thing yes. going on. Yes, oh, absolutely. On, yeah, and, Which and, is nice. And the negativity of that yeah, has, it has dissipated, has dissipated or, yeah, a lot. Or disappeared. You know, it, 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 people, it's affection. The yeah, yeah. rat pack, you yeah. know, just was like, oh, they're young upstarts, you know. Right. Um, but at the time, it was, it was considered oddly really negative. So you've seen so, I mean, you've been, I feel like you've been employed so consistently. Like, was there ever a time where you're like, I just can't take it in this industry and you felt like throwing in the towel or no? No, there was a time when I felt... Uh, uh, when I felt like uh, the industry might be done with me, um, right after uh, Getting Personal was canceled, I, I did two, I did Famous Teddy Z, and then I did Partners, and then I did Getting Personal, and they were all multi-camera sitcoms, uh, which were, at the time, considered this step down, like you were doing, you were, you had done feature films, but now you're just, you know, you're, you're selling out, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're uh, entertaining the masses and doing this, uh, uh, doing these shows, and they were getting canceled, um, which is the worst thing that can happen to you, because it's interesting, if you do a, a pilot, um, for the broadcast ne networks back in the day, but it never sees the light of day, that doesn't count. Uh -huh. um, but if you do a show that actually gets on the air and then fails, that's bad. Uh <laughs> so it's just, consi when you say it doesn't count, it's just like people don't notice it, they don't yes. think twice because no. all pilots basically never get picked up. Yes. The, but that, if something gets canceled, pilots, even though yeah. so many shows get canceled, yes. you're saying that's just like a real that's bad thing. Yes, I, I acquired the nickname The Show Killer for a while mm. there. And, and that, you know, people joke about it, but it, but it did yeah. sink in a bit uh, for people. And um, and so I spent about three years where I just worked two weeks out of out of three years. And I, 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 mm -hmm. I talk about that in the book a little bit. Um, and it was really uh, uh, that was hard for me because I never went to college. I never I didn't have a, a backup thing. I could not be an accountant. Uh, I would be a terrible accountant. Well, we have that in common. <laughs> we had, uh, yes. I really couldn't be I, one either. Yes, uh, um, but I, I was like really thinking, okay, can I teach? Can I, uh -huh. is there something, uh, you know, is there something else I can do? You know, because the reality is the business does not have a market for you. That is not promised. Mm. You know, um, you, there, there, you know, I've been lucky enough to, that there, there's been just enough of a market for whatever it is that I do, yeah. um, that I've been employed really, really steadily over the years, except for that, that three year period. Um, uh, so I, I, but, but, you know, that's not promised and it's not guaranteed mm -hmm. and you have to really think, okay, you know, is, is this, is this going to be my life now? Yeah. Uh, and that was tough. Um, I mean, there's a lot of things in the industry that I would be happy doing, you know, like I find casting directors amazing. Right? Um, I, you I know, agree. people who do that well yeah. are just amazing to me. And it um, seems kind of like a cool job too, to be able to envision these things and see people coming to life. Mm -hmm. And again, yeah. it's, it's all I mean, about people. It's really hard work because uh -huh. especially nowadays you get millions of self tapes. Right, it used to be, tapes. you had auditions, which, you know, were tough in there because yeah. it's long hours. You got to see a lot of people. You got to remember a lot of people and, and remember things about them and stuff like that and uh and it's you know it is not a glamorous profession at all uh and you don't have ca ca casting directors have a weird limited power because they can get stuff before the director but the director makes the final mm. choice so you know they just they their ideas can inform things but they're not you know they don't have the, the yeah. end all power um but good ones are amazing are absolutely amazing and uh uh you know you 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 know, I, I always felt like, oh, that might be an interesting uh, uh, job. Or as I said, like, you know, maybe teaching or, or something like Because I, I went to USC for um, their filmmakers boot camp because, you know, at because uh, uh, I was in my my 30s and, uh, you know, work was slow. And I thought, OK, maybe directing is where I should go. But I got there and half you know half of the students would say so are you teaching and i was like no no i'm i'm learning <laughs> you That's know so interesting um, so, yeah uh, but you uh, would be a good teacher too i, I who knows yeah I, I, sometimes i don't know how how i do what i do so i don't know how i would teach it but um uh, yeah that does seem like that could be tricky because you it is just very do it yeah mm. it is very instinctive so i i don't know but but who knows you know i i, I haven't i haven't set my sights on trying to do that so so who knows? But um, but at any rate, so yeah, there was a time when I thought, uh, you know, maybe this didn't happen. But then um, then two and a half men happened. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that amazing how that happens right after? But so you yeah. didn't get to the point where you really explored something. Uh, no, I never I never got something. that far. Uh -huh. I, uh, no, um, I worked on an episode of Becker 
And I, I did an episode of uh, Andy Richter Controls the Universe, which was a wonderful show on, on Fox, I believe. Uh, uh, those were, that was my two weeks of work in, in three years. Uh, <laughs> so uh, that, those things kept me alive for, yeah. for a couple of years. But those but, things um, do those. They make you, I mean, they contribute in some way to your do. life experience. And they it's not do. always easy to yeah. see, especially during that time. Um, but generally speaking now, how do you feel? You feel secure? You feel like, okay, good. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, the, I mean, Everything obviously. post Two and a Half Men, that was such a, a, a sort of, such a learning experience, such a trial by fire, such a, uh, you know, seeing the show rebooted. And, you know, the, 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 the actual, the reboot of the show actually had enormous success for, for uh, a couple of years there, which was really fun. Um, but, you know, re, re, but ever since every everything post that is wildly different for me. I, I I'm much more laid back now. I I, I enjoy every aspect a lot more now. Um, I take my time a lot more. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I try to really get it right. You know, it's, I'm much more exacting than I used to be um, uh, because that's the that's the effort that I enjoy. And I feel like if when you walk into the room when you go on set people just feel good having you there. So you probably get that kind of vibe back as well because you're giving that energy off. Well, you can set a tone yeah. on the set. And, and because the, the, I was the first person cast in the show, it is kind of up to me mm -hmm. to sort of set the tone of everybody. And, and yeah, again, realizing that everybody's really there to make this a great thing. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, you... you you know, we, we have a, a extended family is an incredibly joyful set. Um, Donald Faison is is just this remarkable powerhouse of energy and and uh, and you know whenever like we'll have an audience in front of the show and sometimes the energy can dip a little bit and he'll just you know explode with something. So you he'll know. feel it. So you think yes. he'll sense it and come yes. out and be like, okay, I need to make a move here. Yes, uh -huh. uh, um, but uh, he just he loves being in front of people. He loves working with the audience. Um, we're all a little nervous because the the um, Michael Manley as a writer has a very has a really interesting style. Things sort of um, uh, it's less jokey and more uh, uh, things kind of loop in on themselves. It's it's hard to describe, but but his sentence structure is kind of uh, fractured, and and so that's a little harder to remember for actors. So we're all we really want to do it justice and do it correctly. So uh, uh, you know w when it comes to show night, we're we're a little more nervous than than we than. Uh, we, we have been on other things. But. Okay, so fractured, is that like more like people talk normally? Because you know, yes. people don't normally talk in full sentences. Yes, um, uh, um, and he, yeah, it, 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 the, the sentences often double back on yeah, themselves. Yeah. And uh, you know, he's given me some monologues where I'm like, I, okay, give, this is uh. gonna take a little while. Because uh, <laughs> I'm, you know, the, 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 it, it's, it's not written uh, in the, it's a little it's it's a little shaggy uh, in this really fun and interesting way. Um, he lets uh, uh, um, it's not all sewn up and perfect and clever. Uh -huh. um, and so uh, so that's a really fun thing to do as an actor, and it comes off with a little extra honesty and a little extra vulnerability. Um, and that's what I like about doing this show. Uh, uh, and that and and uh, you know we we were having fun just. Uh, you know, because everybody with a family knows that right now there's so many weird things going on yeah. that that you know we're we're looking forward to the chance of uh, of exploring all that. Right. Stuff so this on the is show. just for everybody. I probably should have said this at the beginning, and maybe I'll add it to the intro. The show is about a divorced couple who's living together, even with the new partner in the yes. scene. Yes, we're living in the same house called uh -huh. the Nest, uh, uh, but we, you know, we have our own places that we go back to, uh, but we trade off and on uh, uh, weeks. Which, you know, this was inspired by the the real life of uh, uh, the owner of the Boston Celtics. He and his wife shared an apartment with her ex husband for years. Although the kids are going off to college now, so I think actually that that uh, that may have have ended. But the but the what it was really based on was the friendship that they still have. They are Wick Grousebeck uh, and Amelia. Fazolari and, and George uh, Gear, who George Gear is actually in the writers room, by the way, um, and uh, uh, the, the, their friendship is remarkable um, because they you can you, you can tell that that they love each other 
profoundly, but cannot be with each other. <laughs> you know, but they've made their peace with that. Mm-hmm. And and in order to make things good for their kids, they said, you know what, we're going to make this work. We're just going to make this work. And yeah, you're marrying the guy who owns my favorite sports team, and I will live with it <laughs> because you know that's that's the life we've decided to have. Um, so it's really about people, uh, you know overcoming what can be a really hard situation and making it something like by sheer force of will making it positive okay so in your real life who are Mm -hmm. some of those people who you have the best relationships with who are some of your besties my besties uh well my wife is my is my best friend uh, easily um we uh, you know we are um, she gets all my references and she, uh, yeah. and, and no matter how awful a situation can be, we just end up laughing about it. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, I, I had realized very early on that the, you should marry the person with whom, uh, standing in the, in the target parking lot, wearing matching track suits and arguing actually sounds like fun uh, because that's where everybody ends up. You all end up <laughs> in the parking lot of Target uh-huh. wearing matching track suits and arguing about something. Okay. Um, uh, so uh, uh, so you, did, you did well. So I did great. Uh, yeah. no, I'm incredibly lucky uh, and, uh, and my wife is, is um, incredibly fun. Um, other than that, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, my kids and my, uh, um, you know, uh, my, my oldest friend just passed away this last year, which yeah. was very, very I'm hard. Sorry. Um, uh, he and I had actually had some real difficulties in the last few years because he uh, he had uh, uh, at one point a, a uh, uh, opiate addiction and then uh, uh, went to heroin and uh, just uh, had a had a very very rough life. But he had um, gone to AA and had uh, really turned his life around and had reconciled not reconciled with his ex wife but but reestablished a friendship okay. with his ex wife. Um, and gotten close to his daughter again and really turned his life around. Uh, and then he passed away, um, uh, which was, you know, horrible and, and oh. shocking. Um, it was actually his birthday uh, uh, two days ago. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously he had gone through awful things in his life. So you don't see that coming. Uh, uh, you see that coming though because of the awful things he went through in his life but again he had he had brought it back so right. so we were we were still really surprised and and um and and crushed by it um so you know and and he had just texted me the day before he passed you know and i actually had not gotten back to him because he used to that was a thing with us he would leave me these incredibly long rambling texts and i'd be like dude i can't answer all of the you've you've asked me like 18 questions and i cannot answer these you know and but that he was gone and i didn't answer his question still kills me to this day you know um and uh so again you can only take a lesson from that that you know Answer those texts, you know, because you you don't you, it, tomorrow is really not promised. Hmm. So about that. Okay, this will be this will be okay. the end. <laughs> um, okay, couple of things. Sorry, about that. I, yeah, that, that yes. was probably blindsided you. I apologize. I, I also have one of my oldest friends from summer camp. No, 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 no. Is another bestie of mine. This is yeah. Um, okay, just I want to wrap up quickly for Karen, but I don't want to um, ignore this. So A is you probably didn't respond to his texts all the time right away anyway, right? Mm. No. Yeah. No, that it, was the it, it thing. It had become ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> so that was your thing. So yeah. you just did more of your thing that was between the two of you. That would have been normal. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like your last interaction with him was a typical interaction with him, which is okay. Yes. Yes, it is okay, uh, and I, you know, uh, uh, and I'm, I am so grateful for the time that I had with him. Um, he was a very, um, he informed my work as an actor a lot, just because he was this big, huge character, and I used to use things that he said in my characters all the time. With a lot of Ducky was was um, was uh, based on him, um, so you know, he he lives on in in some way. But it all, but you know, we what we do in the world reverberates throughout the world and, and affects other people. And, uh, and, and his, uh, his presence uh, affected a lot of people. 
For you next, I feel a self-help book. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll write it together. I don't know. Yes, I don't know. If but I'm you've the learned guy a lot of lessons, and you've done you you have the the little nuggets of how to approach life. You've yes. got them. I don't know if I, I don't know if me on the face of a self-help book sells that book. I don't think people go, yeah, I want to live like that guy. I don't I don't know. But uh, uh, but uh, you know, I I like I said, I I have. I have loved my life and um, and have been have been lucky enough to spend a, a time with a lot of wonderful people and work with artists that I adored and uh, um, and worshipped growing up and that I got to do the business that 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 affected me so much as a kid ha, has has just been this incredible honor. Um, so you know, there's 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 no regrets here. Well, and I'm sure that people love to keep working with you because of who you are. So I'm sure you have a lot to do with it. Thanks for being on the show, John. Thank you so much. It was a, it was a pleasure. I appreciate it.